that. Great. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'd like to call the October 3rd meeting of the uh, Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board to order. Uh, we'll start with a roll call um, for all of our board members and members of the Department of Planning and Community Development who are with us this evening. Uh, starting with Kim Lyle. Present. Jean Benson. Present. Steve Tinta uh, excuse me, Melissa Tintakulis. <laughs> Present. And Steve Revelat. Good evening, Madam Chair. <laughs> and I'm Rachel Zenberry. I'm from the Department of Planning and Community Development. We have uh, Director Claire Ricker and uh, Assistant Director. Yes. Back, back, back in your yes. role from Acting Director wow. Kelly Linema. Thank you for all of your support in the interim. And welcome, Claire. We're thrilled to have you um, tonight for your first redevelopment board meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, so uh, we will uh, first let everybody joining us tonight know that this is being recorded by ACMI. Um, and uh, we'll move directly into our first agenda item, which is the public hearing for docket number 3712, 80 Broadway. And uh, I will turn it over to Claire, as I understand that they have requested a uh, continuance to a uh, future date. That's correct. Okay, great. Um, so it looks like they've uh, requested a continuance to Monday, November 7th. And my understanding is that they are looking to um, continue to refine their application together with the department. That is correct. Okay, great. Uh, any questions from the board? Jean. Are we going to get a new application? Do we know? Um, by, by October 20th. So we don't have to read the current. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> any other questions from the board? All right, is there a motion to continue the, um, the hearing for docket number 3712 to Monday, November 7th, 2022, as requested? So motion. And second. Great, we'll take a roll call vote, starting with Kim. Yes. Jean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will uh, hear docket 3712 on Monday, November 7th. We'll now move to the second agenda item, which is the Affordable Housing Trust Action Plan. And um, we have uh, members of the Affordable Housing Trust who are here with us this evening who will present the plan. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for and we're us. thrilled to have you here. Thanks. Great. I'm Karen Kelleher, I'm the uh, chair of the trust office. How do you, you guys do yeah. this when you have slides? Well, this is our first time. We're trying a new thing. Because Kelly has amazing graphics. Yes. And every time you put thoughts on paper, she makes them look pretty. Fabulous. And I don't want you to miss them. So is that the same um, slide deck that we have? It's a different slide deck than, than what was. Uh, it's an abbreviated uh, slide deck. Okay. Uh, why don't we flip? We don't have. All right, let's do this. Trustee here, we have had multiple trustees that want to say, I think we tired them out. 
Mm -hmm. you know, with affordable housing uh, professionals that live in Arlington last week and we had a dozen show up and there's another mm -hmm. ten that we were able to identify. So we have robust capacity in this community to do this work. This was our um, timeline. We did a lot of preparation in the spring. In the summer we had a pretty intensive community engagement process. We started with a um, survey, which I recommend you take a look at if you have not in the process of the back of the plan. It has really interesting information about the support for affordable housing, but also the support for additional housing, which is relevant to a broader range of housing needs. Um, we were particularly inclusive, and I think Steve may have called this out in a private meeting, but we tried really hard to include people who might benefit from affordable housing and might not typically participate in the process. We found that to be the right thing to do, to be very difficult, and to require much deeper and longer term engagement and investment to make it work. So we're hopeful that we'll have partners in work as we forward. And then in the beginning of September, we published the draft plan that we're about to go through. We've been receiving commentary to go through the guide and feedback form, as well as <coughs> emails to our email address. We love so much. Thank you. Uh, and our goal is to get this plan to the select board for approval. Hopefully, with a lot of broad support from the community, we're revising it starting today. Our comment period just closed. The email address is still open, and we'll take comments um, when we come in. But we're revising and um, expect to present it to the select board before the end of the month for the uh, okay, their first meeting. There are three particular strategies we're going to go through, but we also set some guiding principles for the action plan. And there's eight of them. I don't want to spend too much time on them because most of them are not controversial. Um, the one we would probably pull out the most would be number two for the ARB, which is that we've heard a lot of desire to help those with the greatest needs, which has been a strong, you know, very vocal uh, sort of perspective in the community, but also to advance solutions for a wide range of housing needs because there is pain all up and down the scale. The market, as we know, is driving luxury housing. There's not driving anything. There's a real strong desire, we heard almost across the board, for income diversity, full range of income diversity. Our mission is only certain income levels. We can talk about that if you'd like to, but uh, that is more specifically how we're targeting the neediest people. Um, but I think that uh, the feedback we've heard suggests that the community is looking for the wide range of housing solutions. So I'm going to move on to this and we also talk about. So this just summarizes the plan in a handy dandy uh, diagram. Thank you, Kelly. Really good, really good. Um, there are three strategies, and each one has 85 year goals. We really wanted to be very clear about what we're trying to accomplish that we can be measured against. But everything that we're trying to do cannot be accomplishable. Our, we have very little money at this point, and we have no power. Right? So uh, influence is our greatest tool right now. We do have some resources, there are some available to us that will help us during this initial plan. But as you'll see, the third strategy is to build with a mutual circle of trust so that we can, on an ongoing basis, invest in a long-term strategy, which is critical. I'm going to spend the most time with this board on creating more affordable housing, because I think it's most relevant for your purview. Um, the first strategy is about how we preserve and modernize our existing housing, which is important, uh, but a little less relevant. Quickly though, um, we have about 1,200 units of affordable housing at various stages. Some of them need modernization and reinvestment, some are brand new, but we need legal, financial, physical planning to be able to preserve them for our community. Um, there's a lot of information in the plan about is that enough? Is it not enough? Why is it not enough? I'm not going to go into that today, but if you're interested in that, we can talk about it. Um, so it's really a planning strategy. You need to know what that housing looks like, what its physical needs will be, what use restrictions are on it, and when will they expire so that we can remove them when they're expiring. We need to plan for their physical needs so they don't pop up and surprise us and lay claim to resources that we have other plans for. More importantly, if we can plan for those needs, we can be proactive and identify the credit resources because leveraging our limited time resources is critical to this very expensive strategy. So, Two different planning tasks. First, an inventory of the units that we have that's more comprehensive than what we already have. I kind of think that DPCD is partly done with that. Um, second is capital needs studies to understand the physical needs of the existing units. 
and this is maybe the most relevant to your purview, which is identifying opportunities to modernize those properties or add more units, um, which is sometimes a possibility. So, uh, and then the last piece of this during the five years would be to create a proactive affordable housing preservation plan for the time. Again, you have no power specifically to do any of this. Um, collaboration with all the other time levels, which is why we have prioritized that collaboration and process. Strategy two is the one I'll spend the most time on, um, and it starts with this fundamental... Can I ask a question about the previous one? The um, preservation plan, does that include the Arlington Housing Authority, as well as privately owned units? Yeah, thanks for asking that question, uh, The housing we have with 1,200 units of it is owned by the Housing Authority, and it is our intent that they be included in that. If they're not, you know, if they don't ever want to make a call on resources, if they can be self-sustaining, then that's less problematic. I think that Housing Authority properties, particularly the state subsidized ones, are particularly challenging to maintain, particularly underfunded. But with creativity, I think that we can help them build their capacity to actually leverage state resources. In fact, our consultant has already met with Jack Nagel to talk about what might be possible. She's an Arlington resident who's already volunteered her time to work with him. Um, and one of the things we like to do is, is some capacity building grants right um, to them and to the husband. Thank you. The other two major owners, just to kind of fill this out, is of course the Housing Corporation of Arlington, they about 150 units. And then the owner of um, Hilbert Village, which is a uh, project based section of private development that has about 140 units. That is a separate private owner with affiliated corporate jobs. Strategy three is to create a strategic plan for housing development. So, the subsidy that we need, we put a number on it, which is a perilous thing to do. There's no number. Mm -hmm. First of all, no one can give you a number that says this is how much it costs to subsidize affordable housing. There's too many variables. But we did it anyway because we felt people need to understand the magnitude of subsidy. The consultant, you know, use actual deeds to peg this to uh, a number. This is for rental housing, but I'm sure it's not actually shocking to people who are well familiar with the cost of housing right now. So four to five hundred thousand dollars of subsidy is necessary to make affordable housing. And that's just the capital subsidy. It doesn't include the ongoing operating subsidy, which is typically needed for the lower income affordable housing, um, which is the housing that we've heard a lot of people desire for in this community. But it requires additional resources. Mm -hmm. Can I? Yeah, yeah. Um, you monetize that subsidy at 400 to 500. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good amount. I think that's, it's a, it's I, a I, lot. I, I agree with you. I think it's low. I, I, I can disagree with you, but uh, did you guys think of that in terms of units? Uh, the reason I say that is uh, right now we have. Inventory where it's six units and above, you have to go, uh, uh, I think, 15% uh, yep. affordable, right? Yeah. So that, that means the rest of that has to be a support uh, when you develop it, uh, the, the affordable units. So I'm, I'm just saying, was there a study of something? Uh, I know what I used for Google Thumb when I used to develop, but I'm just, but you know, that was a few years back. Is it three units? Is it four units? Is it two units? You know, I know it's not one for one. It's not one for one. Okay, yeah. it's usually like three or four. So it's a great question, and I can imagine what your brain is going with it in terms of like what more can we do to create more. But um, it's a really hard number to. I realize that. We, we probably shouldn't put it on the paper, but I just don't think the public understands that this is a math problem that doesn't work. This money magically appeared. We don't want affordable housing, but we need to get this money somewhere. I think you should put it on there. It's, it's really important that people realize what that is. Yeah. It's not, oh, we want affordable housing, and it happens. But it's much more than that, and it has to do with making a project work if you want a private sector to, to be inclusive in this, in this, to do their part, not only just the public sector or a nonprofit. So, and I'll also point out, this is the rental number on the home ownership side, which is actually bigger. Yes. Um, let me show you a little something about how we get to the um, These are just a few data points. Um, 
into the first eight months of this year, the State Department of Housing and Community Development awarded $435 million of subsidy to other communities. To, and we didn't request that. And it's not because the planning department isn't doing the job, it's because the only way to get the money is to have a deal, right? And we have to partner deals. We have to have developers willing to work here that create highly affordable housing. And they're not generally doing that here. Our only course is the Housing Corporation of Arlington. And they create 150 units in 35 years. And so if we want to create at a higher level, we have to build additional capacity and build their capacity and bring the housing authority to the team. It's totally possible. And this is how we know it. These other communities are getting large sums of money from the state. Those are state and federal resources. And here's one where HCA did exactly that on the right. That's the recent project down in Square Broadway, Michigan. These numbers are approximate because the kind of have been changing during the last year. But the total budget for that project to build it is about $26 million. And of that, the town provided just about a million. The rest, 13% of that, is serviced by a mortgage loan, right? That comes from the, the rents um, that are coming into that project. And the rest is state and federal subsidies. So that's what's possible if you build, if you design projects that meet Ask a question about um, again who the developers are who are uh, seeking all that. Are those typically coming through CDCs? Are they coming through private developers? What um, yes. all, all for profits, non profits, more non profits than for profits, but there are some of the most um, highest capacity uh, developers for larger projects are for profits. Great, but there are also uh, developers of color, emerging developers that are mm -hmm. small developers that are for profits that are starting to do this work. There's actually uh, participating as a mentor in a, a program for developers of color that want to become affordable housing developers, and 20 developers come into that program right now. So we want to keep, um, that's why I said that we need to more profit developers, though HCA should be at the forefront of our strategy and bringing developers to partner with them that they can learn from if they need to, but also just you're participating, you're getting part of the developer fee, doing the local work, um, but you're bringing somebody in who has three project managers on staff that can make the deal faster. Can I also add, I'm just going to jump in here, because I applied for actually some of this <laughs> 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 um, They're looking for deals of about 30 units. They really don't want to consider anything mm -hmm. much less than that, unless you have um, services or something special attached, like um, I think I told you about the project they did in Lowell. Um, that had some subsidy related to uh, substance abuse recovery or something like that. They, they're really looking for a number of units, and the magic number is right around 30 right now. Or more. Or more. Or just just how well. Not much smaller. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because when I was looking at this earlier, a few years back, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned number 50. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And unfortunately, Arlington mm -hmm. doesn't have that uh, land do that. So it's a challenge in us to somehow come up with something where we can get to that number and can get this money. And that's why this big zero there. Yeah. Uh, that's why. Yeah. I don't think there's all these little small properties everywhere. And there's no way you can get to well, back there. It's 50, let's say 35, okay? Yeah. Uh, like 30. 35. We'll see it in a minute. 35 is good. <laughs> I wish it was down to 24. It's more, uh, you know, but. You know, 35 is fine. But we don't have 35 unit projects. we got to work it to and create them, right? It's very it's hard size. to. Yeah. Um, you know, when we get those size, size projects, you know, you know, we get uh, accused of building these canyons, uh, of, of darkening the streets and everything else. And, yeah. But it's, it's just, you need some sort of mass unless there's enough land. We don't have that. It's very frustrating. We can't make that easy, but we do have some of our strategies, obviously, in a sense. But um, if you haven't read the results of our survey, yeah, it's it really about, yeah. gives you some support. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very vocal minority that's you know, opposed to any of these. Right. So, agree with yeah. um, Melissa, um, it's okay, it's okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'm just curious, on the DHCD um, award, 
is there more of a state strategy on how it's um, rolled out? Because my sense is that um, the geographic location probably affects that subsidy, that 400 to 500, is that specific to Arlington? Or is that average across the state? So I think further out, you're going to have a different cost yeah. basis. That is an average of 15 or so developments that Arlington specifically worked on because she had the detailed information about them. There's a whole many bunch of different variables, including the ones that are part of your site fully putting out like construction costs are more here than elsewhere. Acquisition costs, uh, basically cost and land costs are higher, but uh, a lot of them are greater Boston, um, Eagle City, so there's there's a bunch of different factors in there that are being managed. Those are not all, none of those are all uh, the things she's worked on in Arlington. There's only ever been two, mm -hmm. two done by the housing two sources of subsidy. That's one. This left side is state federal subsidies. That's pretty much the primary way to get them. There are a few examples here and there that you can get creative and do other things, but that's the way. And then the second is to get developers to pay for it, which everyone seems to want. Mm. Except when there's an actual development that will result in that, in which case there's a lot of challenging conversation that you guys hear right here. Um, these are the two tools. You're familiar with them. I don't need to describe them, but laws are not producing much affordable housing in Arlington. Three to four units a year over the last 40 years because of all of you. I don't need to explain to you why. No, yes, board knows why. We do have a couple of these coming through that may change the outcomes we're getting in this law. So 35 units in one deeply affordable development, which is pretty much what we got in Downing Square. Mm -hmm. The 1365, is that 1630? 1165 bar, Mass Ave, also has 30 units of free, unsubsidized level technical capacity. So if the subsidy is a primary challenge, this is a very real way to tackle it. That is true for homeownership as well. That's been a rare type of 40B. And we have one proposed now that we think has originally been those big 30 affordable homeownership units. In a minute, I'm going to tell you that. These subsidies on the left, they do not subsidize home ownership in ways like Arlington. There is a new-ish subsidy for home ownership that is particularly targeting communities of color. There is no state subsidy for that. Not just a tiny cost. That's really good. So getting developers to pay for affordable home ownership is kind of our own path. We talked to six, seven, eight developers who um, did this to inform the action plan that we put out. And then last week we met with another 12 affordable housing professionals and just underscored we heard the same thing from all of them. What would it take to bring you to Arlington to develop have, you know, highly affordable housing? And it's sites, it's permits, some funding, state local for, for local commitments. But you saw that's a very high amount of leverage, 4% of the budget is a very low amount. And then alignment, like a clear indication of what the community wants, the resources we bring together. We're all going to actually work with them and say we'd like to create affordable housing. So we've been, all of this collaboration, the planning, the public engagement is in part to put ourselves in a position to say what the community wants with a lot of the faith in the community, such as it is will come to town. When they come to town. So these are the actions um, that we laid out. Identified public and private sites for infrastructure acquisition and conversion. Our consultant has, uh, shouldn't say it in the public, but you know, look at what are the potential sites, what are the strategies, how might we do this? We have not laid any sites out, we don't have a specific strategy. We have hired somebody to go and look at new sites because there are a series of categories of sites that are promising, they won't be any surprise to you guys. It's building up on that setup, it's taking existing parking lots and about which go up and replace the parking, but also housing on those sites. It's looking at industrial or mixed, or mixed use development. Um, there's a few other strategies. Number two, predictable permitting. This is 
what I hope we're going to be talking about. You know, what does that look like? One option is the Little House and Little Lake District. Um, that's what done in Cambridge and in Somerville. Um, so I think that we'd love to have a conversation with you guys about what that would look like in Arlington, what it might be. It would be one way to put the welcome mat out for a particular type of highly affordable housing that has a high percentage of affordable needs. So that's a good conversation. Obviously, the MTA is always coming our way. That cannot have affordability written into it uh, for a variety of reasons, but we're hopeful that as it happens, we can bring other tools and ways that we're influencing empowering affordable developers to take advantage of that kind of And there may be other ways. I mean, we can talk about this one as much as we would like to. Funding, we would like to put some of the some funds out and incentivize people to do certain things. So for example, some funding that would um, fund the creation of affordable uh, accessory buildings, helping to create the permitting flexibility for that. Well, we have a couple that are starting to come through the system, which is exciting. We'd like to create some affordable buildings. Um, we would like to issue a request for qualifications to developers that kind of puts that welcome knowledge out and says, hey, if you'd like to work with us, here's what we're trying to do, here's what we can put on the table, here's our priorities, what do we think some of the options are? And then last is just the primary makes the difference in ownership as often progress in the way to get for ownership, which is there's a candid like in our heart to get the physical that's out of the way in our ownership markets. How do we get comfortable with a 100 unit goal? So we set this goal that we want to create a permit 100, at least 100 affordable homes by the period of this plan. This is one pathway to get there. That's why I said I like 35 units pin, because the first 35 units would come from one deeply affordable development that HCA develops. And conveniently, so you'd be about to take a, put a property under a contract that might actually do this. Another one from another developer or a partnership between another developer and the HCA or the housing authority. They want to get into that business. 15 units from the trust funding programs that I just talked about on the left. Those are going to have less public subsidy because they're smaller, they're not, they don't fit into those subsidy boxes easily, so that's why there's fewer um, and less leverage. And then the last would be additional units that we might negotiate, probably provide funding for, from developers that are already building at their 40 or inclusionary zoning, but adding another unit or another five units, or units that are affordable. That would get us to 100. Didn't we all went into this one and a higher level, quite honestly? But we looked at reality and found that if we look over the last 35 years, our average affordable housing creation has been about six units per year. This is three times that. It's 20 units per year. <coughs> it's realistic. I think it's achievable. It obviously will invest on a lot of other people to do a lot of things. We'd love to meet it in three years. And it's not just create, but to permit it, because by definition, Questions? We've been asking for feedback about whether this is too aggressive or not aggressive enough. Um, we got a lot of pushback, not pushback, but um, discussion from the affordable housing professionals about the time of the challenges mm -hmm. and the need to retain flexibility and not constrain ourselves too much in the manufacturing. This is not a legally binding document. It's a way we're talking about this for the community and then that we then can you know, move more, put more agility. We have to go outside of the office and just bring it back to us. Can just ask a quick question about the RFQ um, for developers? Is that anticipated to be through the HCA, through the trust, in partnership with the ACA, kind of pushing yeah. them to form new relationships? What, what's the thought on? the ownership of the RFQ and how I you see that. I honestly haven't thought about that question. I, <coughs> I love the idea of having it be a multi-party mm -hmm. um, RFQ that would include the Housing Information of Arlington, the Trust, mm -hmm. the AHA, the DPC, I don't know that you want to be part of that. You're Maybe like, not, might but not you know, be right great to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, it's a great question. Strategy three. Oh, sorry, I think Alyssa had a, had a oh, question sorry. on that. Okay. 
Um, just curious what the thinking is um, with regard to just the current, I guess, market with regard to the goals. Have you guys talked about that? Um, with interest rates and the slowdown in production, as I understand it. It definitely is going to make it harder. It'll take that subsidy number up. It's been going up, right, because of supply chain issues and labor costs. Uh, obviously, the cost of land has not gone down. We would like to see that, but it's not happening. So it could potentially stretch this, but the other thing that's happening is there are a lot of resources at the state level right now. Federal and state recovery dollars are coming in, so in the same way that we have a little bit of a window of resources that can help us with this plan, that will like, give us a year or two of investment, that's happening in the state and federal level too. So there's a little offset, but all those things will matter. I don't think they'll materially affect our ability to hit these numbers. So finally, you know, for us to realize that mission is a sustainable source of funding what we currently, the total pool available for affordable housing is found there. It's not adequate to our long-term goals. Um, so what we do about that? Um, one, we already have a home loan petition seeking approval for a real estate transfer fee that has not moved through the legislature in this legislative session, which is closing at the end of this year. It seems like it would be, it's very unlikely that will pass in this session. Um, so that will be reintroduced next year. Um, Two year session, so I sort of we're roughly saying let's try to get that passed for this legislative session. At the end of that session, if it hasn't passed, then I think we need to start thinking about another source of different alternative sources. We are one of over 100 municipal housing trust funds, and no, no community has this yet. It has not been approved by the legislature anymore. So there are other ways to fund trusts and we will bring those ideas in if this one doesn't proceed. This doesn't have universal support. Hasn't been clearly defined yet for the voters, but it had been about 60% positive in the survey, which I thought was actually pretty good at a time when we haven't been to come. Yes. We've had local conversations about uh, short term rental fees and cannabis sales tax being potential revenue sources for affordable housing related to secure those revenue streams. But down, they're not expected to be substantial at this point. I don't know what can, I know less about the cannabis right now. Um, like to go to the crack it or um, We want to explore whether there are ways to increase, we probably change the language of this in the final plan, but inclusionary zone payments not to the exclusion of the units. We would rather the developers who are in formal units, um, but where they don't, they have the option to make payments. And some of that is going to the trust with a couple hundred thousand dollars of seed funding from that kind of private funds. But there may be, we're going to fully explore whether there's any way to propose any kind of fees or on developers who are building, you know, large single families or two families in town. There are limited limitations on that. Um, so I'm not mm -hmm. super optimistic, but we'd like to see where we might explore that. That would certainly be popular. Um, and then, you know, here, the various town bodies that make investments in affordable housing over the last five years, we'd like to get to clarity about what the process and how we work together. And we want to explore a private giving strategy. This is one of the very clear we don't want to interfere in any way with HCA's private giving um, or confuse anyone. This might have totally different focus. Certainly could include the joint to join the company to the trust. Um, but we've gotten some creative ideas from the public as well. So that is the plan. And I'll come up for any further questions. I appreciate that this has been a conversation. Uh, I'd like to suggest we talk around back so we can look at ACMI and follow this meeting. We will have a discussion about how we can get this room. Use the screen in the future. Yeah. 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 any um, questions to direct towards you, that would be the easiest. So um, I think what I'd like to do is just run through the members of the board to see if there are any um, comments or questions for uh, for Karen, starting with Ken. Uh, this is great. Uh, and I think you guys 
guys did a great job here. Uh, I do have a couple small questions. Uh, did you guys look at, is that one of the concerns I had is when you do um, uh, the inclusionary and you raise the number so high, uh, in order to make that work, the other costs of the other units go much higher. So you, you're sort of losing that diversity uh, that we're trying to get. So whatever you're building now is really, really expensive units and really, really affordable units and nothing in the middle. And I'm not saying that's going to happen everywhere, but I'm saying it could get cut off that way and you, and you go down inintentionally. So I think that's something we should sort of mention a little bit, mind a little bit about that. It's a balance. I'm not sure what, what it is, but I'm just saying. Sort of, sort of follow that a little bit. I think the trust would agree with you that there's a need to look at our inclusion and zoning um, to file off and figure out how we get more production out of it and what kind of production do we want. I think that's an insightful comment about the cost of the market units can go up um, to cover the cost of the affordable. You also can go so high with the affordable requirements that you make the project not financially feasible and it will um, I believe what we said in the report is that we feel we should look at how to get more, but that it really requires a pretty careful study of the market, of the feasibility of various developments, and we don't have that at our fingertips. So we didn't, we, we didn't offer anything. No, no, yeah, but I think it's something we should uh, look into. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing is uh, you guys look at land, you know, and you say uh, there's not much of it. Everything's all spoken for. Yeah. There's, I think, one parcel that people haven't really paid that much attention to. To me, it's gas stations. Oh, interesting. Right? Uh, with the transfer of electric vehicles, and that's, that's only a growing market. And everybody's pushing for that. Uh, there's going to be less and less gas stations in front of us. So that is a sort of unfound uh, That's an interesting suggestion. land source or zoning source because right now the gas stations are usually zoned in a certain way mm -hmm. where you can't put housing there. Right. Uh, is there a way for us to maybe look at that mm -hmm. and say, and there's, I, I know there's a lot of funding. Uh, there's most gas stations are 30 sites. Uh, but I believe there's funding where you know, the tax, the tax compared to gas per gallon, mm -hmm. part of that goes to come feed up the gas stations. Mm -hmm. So if we can sort of work all that and talk about that, I, I see that sort of un, a frontier that no one's really sort of reached yet. We should give that to our consultant to take a look at and think about putting in the plan as one of the options to explore because a lot of the specific exploration will happen after the plan is adopted. I was just thinking with those uh, those developers you talked to talked about that uh, or any yourself talked about that. Uh, I haven't heard it. You haven't heard that they're telling you. I've not seen it or heard it. I think one of the things I heard from developers was like it's not that we don't have land, it's just that what the potential for redevelopment of that land is under current zoning is maybe not enough to incentivize yeah, the change. That would trigger more affordable mm -hmm. housing. So, no, I, I, yeah. I mean, because I drive up and down Mass Ave, yeah. and, and I, and I, and I see these, these gas stations and the big parking lots and everything else, and I know a four story building there. Mm -hmm. Is your 35, you right there, 30, 32. Yeah. It's somewhere right around there. And that's, that hits it right there on the market. Yeah. And, you know, we'll, we'll take that one back to the consultant and think about that. On the list of you might be. Yeah. You might be. Um, and then, after what I've said, can I go back? To yeah, we can go back to you. I forgot what my third thing was. <laughs> All right, Gene. I agree. It's a wonderful plan, and um, I think there's a good process to put it together to get to where it is, and I think it's something that to take. Um, so we need it. Um, one of the things, and I forgot if I mentioned it at the 
second meeting of when we had a retreat, one of the things that I think would help is, <laughs> is if um, planning and community development had a staff person for affordable housing development, the same way there's a person for economic Because, you know, it, it's not really owned by anyone in the affordable housing trust fund folks that are, you know, volunteers and they're doing great work. But, you know, so that, that was one of my thoughts that one of the ways the town could activate a lot of these strategies is with somebody in the town who's dedicated to make these sorts of things happen. We've heard that from the affordable housing professionals as well, very yeah. strong. Like, let's be realistic here. This is a step that is even happening. So whether it's at the town, we've had enough resources to create more staffing at the HCA and that doesn't So second comment, and I, I also mentioned this one time or another, I've forgotten where. Yeah, I think there's a real balance between our real need to get more affordable housing in town and to retain and do something big with the commercial and industrial parts of the town because we have very little of those. And there's there's some conflict between those like 1165 Mass Ave is an example of that. Great 40B project in terms of what it's going to produce, but it's taking out of the market a piece of industrial property that could have been used for something else. And I'm not sure how the town goes about balancing those, other than to the extent that we can do things in zoning so that those parcels in the commercial and industrial zones don't become the really developer. I think that would, at least in some ways, uh, make it less likely that people would do things in the industrial and commercial zones. But I think it's something that we've talked about as a board from time to time, that there's an obligation to get more commercial and industrial um, development also. So, you know, this is all about affordable housing. Great. When it comes to us, we have to think about the balance between the two. So whether it's um, affordable housing overlay or other things, I think we do have to be of, of, yes. of those. Um, so my thought was not the gas stations. My thought is the Russell Common parking lot. And we got that inserted into the, um, the housing plan, production plan so that we could do something with it. And I think, you know, we have to figure out how we go about doing something with it. It's a big space, probably way to do it with retain the parking, some commercial and lots of residential it's going to need to be zoned. But, you know, so I think that's to me a, a big possibility. Um, I I should just mention when um, there was the survey for the housing production plan, and you got to say where do we think we could put some affordable housing in town. Well, some of it was really like crazy in parks. And I sort of also think somebody might have done that just to like you push know. Some buttons. Yeah, push some buttons. <laughs> Who would do that? But I actually put it in a couple of places where it's now being developed for other things altogether. So I don't think there's any way to look back at those and, and see if we can at least freeze them in place. You did feed those into the yeah. set of sites that our yeah. consultants are looking at. And yeah. so you don't see that list in so, so a couple of, one, one of the things you said, which I've been thinking about for a long time, is how can we get um, the developers of the single family homes to kick in, you know, to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund? And I, I spoke to this very knowledgeable lawyer who you know too, and I said, couldn't we do something that says if you're building something larger than a starter home, you need to pay in 
to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and I was told legally you can't do it in the state. So it sort of seems to me, if that's true, we should think about not only, you know, um, um, home rule on the real estate transfer, but a home rule to allow us to do that um, when they're larger than starter size homes and see if we can sort of get some traction in the legislature. And just that. asked our consultant to look at that. There was another community that just got on the page, uh, home rule petition approved by the legislature, yeah. and I sent it to the consultant and said that they want to know how to do this. Yeah, so I think we need to look at that as a way to get some funding. Yeah, not, and not that. just to add on to that, Gene, that was also something that we started to ideate a little bit around when we talked about potential single family into multifamily mm -hmm. conversions and whether or not there was a linkage yeah. there, potential there as well. Yeah. 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 We'll figure out how to go down that rabbit hole as deep as we can possibly go. Fabulous. Yeah. If it was easy, it would have been done. Fair, fair. And, and the 100 units, I have no idea if that's a stretch goal or a realistic goal. I'd say the town money. It's where we ended up. Okay. Great. Thank you, Jean. Melissa, do you have any questions or comments? Um, yeah, I was getting clarification again, being reminded about um, the transfer, the real estate transfer for sibling gauge, just for clarification. Um, if you want to just state yeah. that to make sure I'm on point. The real estate transfer fee would apply to transfers of real estate. Mm -hmm. There would be a minimum purchase price and it wouldn't apply below that. Um, we didn't set what that would be specifically. We said it would not be uh, above the statewide median home purchase price. And the percentage of your purchase price that would go into the trust fund as a result of this fee also was not set, but it would be between half a percent and two percent. So, by way of comparison, the city of Boston has a home room petition that doesn't kick in until you get to $2 million. So you pay a very different market than you do, right? Um, and I think it's 2%. Um, and it would double the amount of affordable housing um, funds they have to deploy, which is a lot. They have this extraordinary resources. So there are 11, 10 or 11 communities that have home home petitions, and there is statewide legislation seeking mm -hmm. to essentially enable communities to do this without a home home they are opposed by the real estate community. And when this was proposed in town meeting here, it was opposed by our local real estate community. So one of these, my personal tasks is to, after we get this plan passed, to go and start talking with the real estate professionals in our community about the fact that what we have is not, it's not working to get us enough and see if we can get some money. So that's what it would do. It, it, it's not a tax that has to be paid on an annual basis. So it, only burdens a homeowner when they sell their property, which is part of what I think is kind of appealing about it. It's not imposing a burden on an elderly person who's having to pay their real estate taxes unless and until they sell their home. And almost every homeowner in Arlington, in very short term, ones have great tremendous windfalls in equity. So it feels like, um, to some, this is the windfall you're receiving, although you lost the think of it as far as it's very, it's very important and who's championing that now at the state level? Our delegation. Is the delegation. Do we have like um, a representative like Cindy Friedman or anything? Yeah, Cindy Friedman, uh, Sean Charlie, and Dave Rogers, they've all um, they partnered to introduce it in the Senate and the House. And there is a statewide coalition advocating for this. I'm just going to look it up. I can't remember. So it's without okay. no ha, no low no option housing for housing affordability. Okay. Um, Lynn is at it as well. Yeah, I great. In there as well. And, um, it's kind of like that summer bill. Just happy to do it. But it's, um, it's pushing for the statewide. Thanks, Karen. I guess the last question, I was curious more, um, at least on the presentation, there was more reference to 40B, which I feel is kind of more reactive versus a 40R, um, trying to set the tone. And I didn't know, um, in your conversations with the consultants, um, if that's been more looked at as a tool. 
to me that, that um, maybe touching base with your consultant on that piece if you've selected sites because if what you're saying with regard to you know the constituency at large is in favor of what you're doing not only there's a small minority of people then you're going to have more success kind of being more proactive and setting the table in these places I would think. It's helpful. Yeah. It's helpful. It's the only other I agreed. I felt it was comprehensive and realistic, and it seemed um, there was a very nuts and bolts nature to it. As in, like this is how you would actually go about doing such a thing. Uh, it was concrete. I, I, I really, I found, I, I like that. Um, I appreciated the concrete goal of 100 units in five years. I think this is achievable. The first year that Cambridge's affordable housing overlay was in, in effect, they permitted 350 um, affordable units for that program. So doing, granted Arlington is a different community, but I think we could do 100 in five years. Um, regarding the, you know, the map and the tension between affordable housing and commercial development, one of the reasons we have such a small amount of land zone commercial is because back in the 70s this board proposed a, a new map in which town meeting adopted that effectively eliminated a lot of what were commercial districts at the time. Um, there's, I don't, I, I think what we do with the commercial districts is going to be an ongoing conversation, but I, I don't think it's, I don't think we should really, or we need to be constrained by what's on the map now. Um, you know, expanding that would be, it could be beneficial, but it's a, it's a, it's a whole other, it's a whole orthogonal combination. 
And um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for all the thoughtful comments. Thank you. I just have um, one question for you, and it's something that um, I'm sure there was a lot of discussion around. The, the last part of the plan was about establishing sustainable funding sources, and I just wanted to get your take. You know, you went through them and talked about how challenging some of those would be. Um, and also that there are other um, housing trusts in similar communities, which, which are well funded, um, that, it, that funded. I may have misheard you. Which uh, are funded. Which are funded. I don't know what well funded well, means. Okay. Some are, some so, are modest. Some are modest. I, yeah, I just, you know, without the home rule petition yeah. that we've identified, um, I don't know how long-term sustainable some of those potential options are. And I'm just wondering if you could shed some more light on some of that conversation, because I think it's an important one yeah. for this group to do the excellent work that's been set out. And, uh, you know, I think, Ken, your suggestion about having, you know, a staff member potentially also dedicated to this is... That was Jean, I'm sorry. I attributed it to my <laughs> to the wrong person. That's all right. I'm sure we were all thinking. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's it's just it to me that's a, a huge yeah. item to solve, and I'm just curious about what some of the discussion around that was. It's interesting, there wasn't a ton of discussion about the funding part, probably because we went through all the other stuff first. Right. Right. But I would say there's a few things that have been suggested or brought mm -hmm. up. Um, one town meeting member has previously suggested that we actually seek an increase of the CPA percentage mm -hmm. that we are imposing to increase the amount of CPA dollars coming in, but to be a mark of a much larger percentage for affordable housing. Um, there are communities that issue bonds to fund affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pathway. There are other strategies out there that rely on things like cell tower use. I mean, it's sort of very great in some ways. What are the resources in our community? Um, so the obvious ones we put on the page. Right. Um, I think we have to get creative. Right. Whether that's the conversation with a select board or you know whomever that winds up being, I think I think it's really important to the redevelopment board, right? That, that this group is really that you know it's really important to find you know find funding sources for for this group because it's this important work that needs to, to be done. We figured we would make a stop. Yep. Talked about and decided we didn't need to bring them into our housing stakeholder meetings yet. Sure. They probably wouldn't come, but, um, but that we do need to go and stop with them. The, the support on that committee over time is something that we to this challenge. Yeah. We may be asking this board for a letter of support from CPA funding for the next fiscal year. So. <laughs> okay. Yes, we will also continue to try to rely on existing resources. And obviously, um, we're hoping to use some of the hard work on Any other questions? No, it wasn't really an, uh, an idea or a question. It was just uh, saying I'm, I want to congratulate you guys on on this thing, not only wanting more affordable housing, but actually putting down concrete Metrics. steps and how to do it, how, how different steps, where everybody else screams, mm -hmm. we've got to focus on affordable housing, but don't give, don't, don't give any answers. I think you guys did a great job doing that. And I'm not saying you have all the answers, but it's a great step. And which way is to look at everything else? And that's a lot better than some other people have done saying, oh, we need to housing. We're good. It's, you know. They come, all those people have come into this conversation, I feel, and have fed us their ideas and, and we're incorporating them into the That's good. But now we have that. And, yeah. and I was amazed at how many people want that. The, you know, when you did a survey, I looked at a survey, wow, that's, uh... We're relieved. We saw the survey results, yeah. So, yeah. congratulations. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the yeah, time to be with us today, too. Thanks for taking your time to meet us. Great, thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, so that closes agenda item number two. Uh, we'll now move to agenda item number three, the ARV rules and regulations. And um, Kelly, I believe that you have a draft um, of uh, changes that have been proposed to the rules and regulations, which catches us up 
on several items which we discussed following um, annual town meeting and special town meeting. Um, so did you or Claire want to take us through? Yeah, I mean, just stand up here. Okay, okay great. That would be great. I'm not going to project anything. Right, we have them all on our screen. Yes. So the, um, the draft that you have before you reflects some of the changes that were brought up during the ARB's retreat. Um, it, the changes really don't start until age seven of the draft. Um, so just to highlight, um, the addition of uh, potentially requiring an applicant to provide a sketch of compatible model as an alternative to a physical model to add to future sketch up, uh, like a sketch up model of the town. Um, we also talked about requiring solar energy systems or solar energy system assessment, which may be something that needs to wait because of the Attorney General's delay on approving that amendment to the bylaw. Um, so it's something that could either be discussed tonight or we could bring back after December after the Attorney General makes a decision. And then going on to page 12, um, just adding in family child care as a use that is eligible for review under religious and educational uses based on the changes that were made um, in, during special town meeting in 2022. Um, and those are all on page 22, so there's just a few changes there. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we'll start with Ken. I think you had some suggested language modification for um, the SketchUp model requirement. Uh, yeah, on uh, Rule 14, number two. Yes. Uh, I'm going to leave that to Gene to uh, wordsmith for me. Well, let me try this as Kim has inverted me. So the sentence would say, the board may require an applicant to submit a physical model and or a digital sketchup compatible model. Is that what you mean? Uh, I just want to well, I just want to say that I don't know. If they submit the sketchup model, that we, uh, we would have the ability to use it in our 3D model. Mm -hmm. If that's assumed right, then I'm okay with it. Yeah. I just changed the word from request to require an applicant because you need to change the word. Did you get that? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, great. And then I would agree with you guys on the uh, environment solar energy system. Can we just table that number eight? Just tell uh, I agree with it. Can we just table that till uh, we see what the Attorney General comes up with? It, it, yeah. I, you know, the same way our um, bylaw is modeled significantly on the Watertown one, this is taken right from the Watertown one. So you did this with fly? Well, the thing is, Watertown is the city of the town of Watertown, so they didn't need the approval of the AG. So I don't know why the AG is holding it up. So the attorney general doesn't review changes right. to zoning and cities. Yes. They only review they only review changes to zoning in towns when town meeting approves it. So they aren't looking into other zoning by zoning ordinances from cities when they're looking to approve or adopt or review zoning. I'm hoping to discuss this is like not changing the FAR but something different. They're just spending a little more time with it. I don't mind adding it later once they can say okay. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I think we have to do that. Yeah. So, That's all I have. Sorry. Go ahead, Gene. I, Thank you. This is not the public hearing, right? After we know if these are going to Yeah, then we can schedule the public hearing. Okay. Do you have any suggestions or changes? Okay. Melissa? No. Steve, any additional? Uh, no. The, I just, I do have a, a question. Um, for the changes in Rule 19 A and B, where we're, you know, so we're changing it to read uh, reasonable regulation of religious, nonprofit, educational, family child care, and child care facilities. Um, I, I thought the wording was a little strange, but it, going into 
going into different parts of 40A, it looks like family child care or, and child care are actually two defined different things. Mm -hmm. is, is that correct? Yes, and there are two distinct definitions in Arizona bylaws. Well. Okay. Uh, nothing further. On that, is this responsive to the AG's letter which said it's okay that you might want to, you know, edit your bylaws? Um, I, we didn't, we didn't modify the amendment in our bylaw. Well, based well, on that, but, but yeah. But I'm just wondering whether this is consistent with what the agent wrote to us. The so the attorney general's letter was really just about the, the difference between a large family child right, care yeah. and a, so and a this small family. And so we don't really draw a distinction okay. in it, and so it was really just trying to clarify that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessary to clarify it. So we will not need to take a vote tonight because we'll need to move this to public hearing, correct? Yes. Okay. So um, just to summarize, we will make that change to uh, remove the references to the, uh, the solar energy system mm -hmm. section until that's been approved by the Attorney General, and then we will make those uh, small wordsmithing changes to uh, number two under Rule 14. Yes. And the others were good. Okay. Can I ask one? Okay. Yes, of course. Because I wasn't involved in this in the past when you amended your rules and regulations. Yes. So we do a, um, a legal notice. Yes. To, and then do we keep the track changes in for that public hearing? I believe that we have in the past. Okay. Yeah. So it's just easy for people to, to see what the track changes are. And then we'll just um, we'll vote. We'll hear a public comment, we'll vote, and, uh, and they'll okay. go so to action. Point, I think if it's okay with the board, we could get this in for the November 7th. Meeting. Sounds good. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. So let's now move to agenda item number four, which is the 2023 schedule leading to 2023 annual town meeting. And, uh, Claire or Kelly, I'm not sure <laughs> which one. Is, sorry, jump on back up there, please. <laughs> please and thank you. Um, so this follows. Um, it, we, I really appreciate that you put this together. I believe last year was the first year that we used this, um, and um, I think it was really helpful for the many people who um, came to us and actually worked with us prior to submitting their warrant articles for, for town meeting. There, was, there were several who took advantage of meeting with us for feedback. Um, so I appreciate that we have this again. Um, if there's anything in here that differs perhaps from the um, way that we approach this, it would be great, Kelly, if, if you point out anything that you um, want to call our attention to. Um, I will, if I can get Oh, okay. Um, give me just a second. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, just off the top of my head, what, the only thing I really added was, I think in the last version we had sent out last year, we didn't have those periods in October and November. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Oh, always, always come here. Um, we didn't have this section in here for October and November of the submission of ideas. For the preliminary. That was just yeah. something the board made a call. Sure. To the public board. Um, but otherwise, the only things that are different here are the dates. Yep. Because it reflects 2023. Sure. And then those potential dates for A or B public meetings, I mean, that really is going to depend on the number of zoning amendments that are proposed. So those really are just the Mondays in March and into April, kind of leading up to the report to town meeting. Sounds good. Uh, I'll see if there's any questions or uh, comments from the board, starting with Ken. No, I like the chart at the end. Yeah. Unusual. It's, it's the linear thing that's good. Gene. I agree. I think it's really good. I think if you voted, you should get it up on the website. Great. Melissa? Same. Steve? I think it looks good. Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve the Redevelopment Board review process and schedule for 2023 annual town meeting? So motion. Second. Second. 
the vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And Abby, yes as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, and it would be great if, if we could get that posted. I think that would be great. To inform people that the schedule is up and if they want to schedule a preliminary hearing with the board. Perfect. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Okay, that takes care of agenda item number four. Uh, agenda item number five is uh, meeting minutes. So, Kelly, hang on right there. Yeah, I do have these at home. Okay, fabulous. And I know, uh, I believe, Steve, you sent comments earlier. I'm not sure if those are in, I don't think those are in track changes. So you may want to just run through those for us, Steve, mm -hmm. if you could. Yes. And then we'll run through and see if there are any other changes. Okay, so... Um so there, were, I had proposed six changes. Okay. Um, number one is on page one, end of the second paragraph. Uh, in the last sentence, I suggested changing local requirements for multi homes cannot be different to local requirements for the energy efficiency of multi family homes cannot be different. Okay. Okay. So uh, page one, paragraph three, third and fourth sentences. Uh, this one is a proposal to change the word policy to requirements so that the end of the third and beginning of the fourth sentence reads, if Arlington meets the stated housing requirements by January 24, 2024. Okay. To meet the housing requirements, 10% of housing, and so on. Can I suggest guidance rather than requirements? Because that's technically what it is. All right, guide, I, I, guidance it is then. Guidance. Thank you. For both, or just the... Uh, For both. Oh. They should be Okay. Okay, so uh, page two, paragraph number two. Uh, second sentence. Uh, so currently it's... So the... Let's see, consider changing the second sentence to... Strategy number two of the housing production plan is to achieve compliance with this. So changing is compliant to to achieve compliance. Yep. Uh, next, page two, paragraph two, third sentence. Um, consider rewording as Mr. Revelax said that he would not like to treat this as a top level goal in itself. Page three, first paragraph, consider wording as Mr. Revelak suggested including the stormwater management requirements in the industrial zone and identify which level of storm event to use in the regulations. And then finally, page three, third paragraph, second sentence, uh, consider ending it easier to get funding for a project that is allowed by right, adding the word allowed. That's all I have. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, any additions or corrections? No. No. Dean? No. Ken? No. Nope. All right. Is there a motion to uh, approve the Monday, September 12th meeting minutes as amended? So motion. A second. Take a vote, starting with uh, Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm yes as well. So the September 12th meeting minutes have been approved as amended. Rachel, can I ask you a question yes. around agenda item four? Um, yes. Another thing that's on here was just seeing if we could do a quick discussion of the ARB meeting schedule for the first few months. Oh, thank, thank you. I missed that. Let's go back to agenda um, item number four, please. Largely because the board usually meets on the first and third Mondays of the month, but yes. that would be meeting on January 2, and I'm not sure. If, um, yeah, that's probably not a good idea. Actually, Melissa was not at that meeting, so she has to abstain. You are right. You're right. So um, we'll retake the Okay. So let's retake the <laughs> vote. Then we'll go back to agenda <laughs> item number four. And uh, yes. And Melissa will just abstain. Yes. So yes. 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 And abstain. There we go. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you very much.
Okay, so um, let's talk okay. about the meeting, the 2023 um, meeting calendar. So Did we have to reopen that? Agenda item number four? Yeah. Uh, it's part two, so we've already approved the actual, okay. yeah. But we will, this is a meeting, yes. You don't have all of the dates in here. Were there specific dates that you wanted to review? Um, I think, uh, you know what, maybe we should just uh, do this on the 17th. How about that? Let's do that because I think we typically do that. We we try and lay out yeah, everything from January through June as a separate calendar. And I think that would probably be easier than trying to do it in this format, okay. if that's Sorry okay. That. No, no worries. Okay. Anything else on agenda items one through four, five? Just on, yep. I, on the schedule, what we need to talk about when we come back is our own schedule. Yes, for hearings. Well, no, also for the articles that we want to put in there yep. to change the zoning. Yep. Yes. Okay. Great. Right. You Right, but a schedule for oh. when we're going to, the same way there's a schedule for the public pieces. Yes. I think we should tie that into the 17th, right? For the ARB right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can do that on the 17th. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. okay. Uh, so now let's move to agenda item number six, which is um, open public forum. So, nope. Okay. Head shake from our from our attendees this evening. So at this point, we'll close open forum. Yes. I, I do have a bit of new business. Let's go to new business. So actually, Kelly, I think that's something I'd like to add after public forum in the future is a new business section. We've been needing to do that recently. Sure. Great. Okay. Thank you. So let's go ahead and move to that. So I recently discovered that Winchester is having a special town meeting in November where they will um, vote on a proposed ADU bylaw. So the planning board in Winchester is working on getting a, putting together a public forum with you know, people who've done ADU stuff um, to, you know, to give a talk and give little talks and answer questions from residents. And somehow they got a hold of my name. <laughs> <laughs> so I will uh, likely be participating in their ADU panel uh, sometime That's in October. Great. I think there are a lot of communities looking at that. I know that, um, gosh, who was it? Wakefield is also mm -hmm. looking at an ADU bylaw. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Fantastic. Any other new business? All right. Uh, seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So, motion. I'll second. Take a vote, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.